Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. And make us worthy, O Master, to dare with confidence and without condemnation to call upon the heavenly God as upon a Father, and to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and under the ages of ages. Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed he is risen. Please welcome back Professor Eric Janislawski. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deacon Sabatino. Congratulations again on your ordination. And uh, thank you for having me back for a second night. So yes, if I go too long, you can throw stones at me. That would be a perfectly fine Pauline way to let me know. So, but this will be a jam-packed hour, and I want to go a little bit briskly, but just to remind everyone where we were last time, uh, we spent a lot of time on setup, and the setup is important. So we talked about the remote historical context of the Great Commission, go therefore and baptize all nations. We talked about uh, the first seven chapters of Acts uh, showing the apostles going out to the Jews, to the Jews, and again to the Jews. But it's then with the first conversion of Paul, and then the baptism of Cornelius at the hands of St. Peter in Acts 10, where we begin to see the beginning of the mission to the Gentiles. And we talked about the, the critical importance of Acts 10, Peter's first statement about how what God has cleansed, men should no longer call unclean or common. Remember we talked about the vision of the unclean animals and how that was a symbol for the removal of the separation between Jew and Gentile, a people once considered clean versus a people once considered unclean and therefore not to be touched or associated with. Then we go a little bit further into Paul's first two missionary journeys where Gentile converts start to come into the church en masse. And this provokes a controversy. Certain groups of people called alternatively Judaizers or false brethren or the Pharisee Christians or the circumcision party uh, preach a different gospel than Peter and Paul, claiming instead that it is necessary for Gentile Christians that they receive circumcision and keep the law of Moses or else they cannot be saved. Or to say the same thing another way, that what Peter was preaching hitherto that by faith and baptism, one received the good news of Jesus Christ and received remission of one's sins. That was invalid if one had not been circumcised and was not a Torah-observant Jew following the 613 precepts of the Law of Moses. All of that was spiritually not unto salvation unless circumcision and observance of the Law of Moses were being done. We okay for that, that general background? And that leads to the first great council in the church, Acts 15, the Council of Jerusalem, where we have Peter's important statement of faith. So just to start there, and we'll dive right into Galatians 2, where we left off last time, just to remind everyone. After there was much debate, this is Acts 15, 6, the apostles and elders were gathered together to consider this matter, and after there had been much debate, Peter rose and said to them, quote, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made choice amongst you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So that's a reference back to Acts 10. And God who knows the heart bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, but cleansed their hearts by faith. That's going to be a central statement 
of Petrine justification, God cleansed their hearts by faith. And he made no distinction between us and them, but cleansed their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you make a trial of God by putting a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? That's a cryptic remark on the part of St. Peter as recorded. Calls the law of Moses an unbearable yoke. What's going on there? I want you to file that away because when we talk about uh, Galatians 3.23, we're going to return to that Petrine remark, the law as an unbearable yoke. But we believe, Peter continues, that we shall be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. Jew and Gentile saved the same way, through grace, through faith, which cleanses the heart. Then James stands up and ratifies what Peter has said. First, seeing the mission to the Gentiles as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. We get a few quotes, and then James adds in 1519, Therefore it is my judgment that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the pollutions of idols, and from unchastity, and from blood, and from what is strangled. For from early generations Moses has had in every city those who preach him. For he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. And then they send out the first encyclical letter, recording the same acts and judgment, and giving it to the church in Antioch, so that anyone who is concerned about this issue might know what the apostles and elders of the church had to say. Now James' statement is also important, and this will get us into Galatians 5 too. Why does, why does James make this little addendum, which ends up in the letter that they send out? But we should write to them, meaning the Gentile Christians, to abstain from the pollutions of idols and from unchastity and from what is strangled and from blood. Remember, the Pharisee Christians were rigorists, and we talked briefly about reconstructing their position Hearing just one side of the telephone conversation, we have to reconstruct a little bit what the Pharisee Christians were teaching. But part of their concern is you're going to let the great unwashed in? We've been men of religion our entire lives. These are the rigorists, after all, putting laws around the laws of Moses. These are the strainers, if you remember my metaphor from last time. If you don't strain, you're not pious. These are people who look at the possibility of Gentiles coming in from whatever Gentile moral background they previously occupied and said, that's it? That's all they have to do is believe in the gospel, be baptized, and they're good? Hunky-dory? There's a concern about Gentile moral conduct. And James, who is the bishop of Jerusalem, is the bishop who's uh, pastor over the dissenters. The Pharisee Christians are headquartered in Jerusalem, after all. And so James has to speak a word to these men to make the council's teaching intelligible to them, to speak to this main objection. This is a beautiful thing about the ecumenical council. Not only do you have to have an authoritative decision, but even after that, that's when the work starts to have to get done in earnest. Because not only do you uh, see rejoicing on the side of those who are favored with the judgment of the council, Paul and Barnabas recount the works that have been worked amongst the Gentiles, and everyone rejoices, but the church has an equal obligation to make intelligible to those that might dissent the logic behind the church's teaching. And so James does something, if you know what he's alluding to there, with those moral precepts, that is very intelligible to the Jewish mind. What are those prohibitions? Idolatry, unchastity, murder... Those are a reference to what's usually called the Noahide laws. They're the laws that God gave to Noah in Genesis 9. After they get off the ark, God gives some basic moral precepts to Noah and his descendants. Because that set of people, Noah and his descendants, equals the entire human race, this was a concept Jews already embraced as kind of a basic moral standard that even the Gentiles had to adhere to. So the question in the Pharisee mind is, what is this? If their hearts are cleansed by faith, then what? Can they do anything they want to? And we'll see that problem crop up in Corinthians if you ever wander into that letter. Boy, they were doing just about anything that entered into the human mind. Uh, but no, James says, no, no. There's still a moral expectation for them to follow. And then to make that as plainly intelligible in as Jewish terms as his audience might desire, he says, like the Noahide laws. Laws already, which at the time of Christ were associated with the natural law, basic precepts that a godly man had to follow, 
a code that the Gentiles were already expected to follow if Jews were to deem them godly people. No idolatry, no unchastity, no murder, etc. So the church is beginning to limit its position on what the fabric of Christian moral life looks like. No longer defined religious man equals doing all the 613 precepts of the law of Moses, but does require some kind of conduct. Our Lord himself summarizes that, of course, as love of God and love of neighbor, the two greatest commandments. But how does that work out into daily life? Are there further concrete moral expectations? And James says, you bet, you're bippy. <laughs> law of Noah might be a good place to start. And we'll see that Paul will begin to flesh that out a little bit more in Galatians 5. So I want to keep that Acts background in mind as we go back into Galatians. So let's go back to Galatians 2. Now this was part of the pull quote on the poster, so I guess I should speak to it. Uh, everybody loves Galatians 2.11. We're still in that uh, portion of the epistle known as the narratio, or the historical summary leading up to what's occasioned this present dispute. Uh, but for all of you that like moments of ecclesiastical controversy, these sort of pinky-biting moments in the uh, newspapers of church chronicles, uh, I don't, but some people really get drawn to these things. Ooh, Cardinal so-and-so said what? Uh, you get the chiefest of all delicious scandals in 2.11. Paul writes, When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he ate with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And with him the rest of the Jews acted insincerely, so that even Barnabas was carried away by their insincerity. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? And then we get Paul's central thesis. We ourselves who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And then he continues and repeats himself a few more times. Not by works of the law, because by works of the law shall no man be justified. And then a little bit further down, I do not nullify the grace of God in 2.21, for if justification were through the law, then Christ died to no purpose. And that gets us into the meat of Paul's justification theology. Now what was that scandal at Antioch? Antioch, remember, is Peter's see. This is his church. He went there first. That's why it's one of the five patriarchal sees. It was one that Peter planted before he went to Rome, where ultimately he would continue on as bishop until his death. So Peter is in his own church at Antioch. We know that the church at Antioch was a mixed church. It had both Jew, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians as part and parcel of this church. And so what happens is, Peter seems to be doing what he was doing in every other place where he's, he has had a mission to the Gentiles. He is going in, eating with, associating with, socializing with the Gentiles as part of his being a pastor to them. But then come certain men from James. Now what does that mean? From Jerusalem, from the headquarters of the Pharisee Christian faction. And when they come to visit Peter, Peter is in a pickle because these are observant Jewish Christians. They are Pharisee Christians. They still adhere ardently to the kosher law. Now, as I said last time, it's not like I can be kosher with you and walk over here a minute later and be unkosher with you and come back here and be kosher. Observing the kosher law sometimes means you incur ritual impurity that lasts for days. You have to undergo a ritual washing. It limits the things that you can come in contact with, even the houses and vessels of those that are unclean. And so you can't just bop back and forth between two factions of people. So when the Jewish Christians come from Jerusalem to visit Peter and his church in Antioch to see how wonderfully things are going, what does Peter do? Does he receive them and say, oh, come emissaries from the mother church in Jerusalem. Let's come and have table fellowship and sit down. And in order to do that, what does he have to do? To keep kosher 
and to avoid anyone who is not kosher. Or else maybe he says in his mind, uh, I'd love to stay with you guys, but I know how you are about the works of the law of Moses. Um, how about we just exchange letters? And I'll wash my hands good before I write them. <laughs> so Peter, in attempting to be charitable, receives the Jerusalem emissaries. And in doing so, he begins to keep kosher so that he might have fellowship with them. But to do that, he withdraws from the Gentile half of his church. Now imagine what kind of message that would send. I'm sorry, I can't eat with you tonight. I can't visit your house because the Jews are here. And I'm doing the Jewish thing now, and you are unclean. I have a good friend that became an Orthodox Jew. He's a friend of mine from Yale College. And, uh, you know, he was a not-so-observant Jew as an undergrad, but then he got really into it. Now he's black hat, Hasidic Orthodox. Uh, when I first saw him, I made the mistake of trying to run up and give him a hug and a little pat on the shoulder. No, dip, 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 dip. <laughs> now, I wasn't offended, but some people consider that, you know, very unsociable. Watch, you can't even shake your friend's hand anymore. Well, it's just his way of being. I don't get offended by it, but it does start to cause a palpable social division. Now, imagine this, right? If you're a newly received Gentile into the church at Antioch, to take an easy example, since both Sebastian and Sabatino are here, they've just received holy orders. Imagine if having been recently ordained, they go, well, you see, guys, uh, I'm in the upper echelon now. I can't have dinner at your house. I can't shake your hand. Uh, uh, the priests are here. I can only associate with the priests. Wouldn't that be kind of disastrous for communal charity? And then talk about what a mixed message it might send. What, are the Gentile Christians second-class citizens in the communio of the church? Or if there's scandal about, in terms of some people teaching, that you cannot be saved unless you observe the works of the law of Moses, and then all of a sudden the special people from Jerusalem come, and Peter says, I'm with them, I can't be with you right now because you're unclean. Well, what exactly does that mean to the weak in faith about the status of their salvation and their holiness? So Paul is chiefly concerned about scandal, about sending an awful message to the church at Antioch. And Paul says to Peter, you had an imprudent judgment, sir. You judged wrongly. When it came down to whether you should have told the Judaizers, look, you're going to be in a mixed church. You better get used to things. There's going to be bacon and shellfish flying around. Either, you, either you're comfortable with that or stay home. Peter chose the latter and withdrew. And so Paul rebukes him. Now, a lot of people who are heretics in history have loved to imagine themselves striking the pose of Paul, speaking truth to power to St. Peter. And a lot of them like to fashion that into the image of this brilliant individual theologian. Now, as you remember from the introduction to Gal Galatians, Paul disclaims that. And he says, I'm only teaching you the gospel. But uh, they like to fashion themselves, these heretics in a Pauline mode, about, well, this brilliant theologian has discovered the truth of the gospel, and it's his job to tell Peter, I'm going to rebuke you to your face. Luther considered himself doing just that in his own commentary on the Galatians. And it's important, I think, because of the way this moment gets bent in ecclesiastical history, to remind people what's going on here. Yes, Paul is rebuking Peter. But Paul is not rebuking Peter with Paul's doctrine against Peter's. Paul is reminding Peter about what Peter himself taught, said, and did in Acts 10, and again in Acts 15. Paul's rebuking Peter with Peter. That's one of the reasons why historical context is important. And so we get to the root of the issue here, that justification is by faith and not by works of the law. Now last time we wrapped up with a quick discussion of the important terms in play here. Justification we talked about is that process whereby one goes from a state of condemnation to a state of right standing or righteousness or uprightness before God. Ultimately rooted in covenant terminology, whether one is meeting one's covenant obligations or if one has not, how one regains a state of right standing before his Lord. How one is made righteous. Justificatio, made righteous. That's justification. Second important term was works of the law. Now with the historical background clearly in mind, I assert to you that no sane exegete 
can have any other view of the phrase works of the law than works of the law of Moses. It's plain from the context in Acts. It's plain from what Paul speaks about in Galatians later on that he's referring to what we find in Exodus 20 through Deuteronomy and none other. That is its literal sense. Whenever he wants to use for short, he usually says the law. And occasionally, you know, he'll say works of the law of Moses, but usually it's just works of the law, ergon nomu. But it's all referring to the same thing. In fact, in Galatians, he doesn't even say for short works. And so one question is going to be, how do we get from what's clearly referring to the observance of the law of Moses, this full-blown Protestant sense of works meaning anything of a voluntary character that a man does? That's going to be an important thing to settle by the end of this evening, and part of it's going to involve Luther's reading of Galatians. But Luther sits on Augustine, who read Galatians 3 in a particularly interesting way. So we're going to dig into that in a moment, but flag that in your mind. What does works of the law mean? Works of the law of Moses, but how does it morph into this very broad category of works full stop? Third thing we've got to look at is uh, faith, and that's going to be another huge term for Paul. What does Paul mean by faith? What is entailed when Paul talks about faith? And he does so in various ways. Now to broaden that out, since we're not sort of getting a third time tonight, We're reading Galatians, but I'm going to bring in some other quotes from across the Pauline corpus to begin to fatten out Paul's concept of faith. So that's one of the handouts that I called the process of justification. That one has a number of Paul quotes to begin to round out what Paul means by faith. But we're not going to get into that yet. I'm just going to flag it. And the last one is freedom. What does Paul mean by freedom in Galatians 5? So let's take a look at how Paul defends his thesis. Thesis having been stated, that's our propositio, our central proposition. Paul begins to argue for his thesis. Now, on the handout that I brought last time, which is uh, ooh, floating around here somewhere. I don't even have one myself. Yeah, it says at the top, okay, I called it overview of the main argument of Galatians. I'm going to step through that for maybe the next 20 minutes. So if you want to follow me on that, you can. So Paul gives what I can identify here as four separate arguments for why justification is not by works of the law of Moses, but rather by faith. First one is, uh, Paul's a good rhetorician. A short, sweet, emotional press based on their personal experience of Paul's evangelizing them. So just read the first five verses of Galatians 3. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun with the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? Did you experience so many things in vain, if it really is in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles amongst you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now just grab the first word of the next part of the argument. Thus Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Don't forget about the thus. That's going to be a link between verses 5 and 6. But let's focus on 1 through 5 right as the first short argument from experience. Jesus says you're not supposed to call your brother blockhead. Raka. You're liable to judgment if you do that. Uh, oh, foolish Galatians is not really so much a term of opprobrium. Anoetos, you might say in English, clueless. You know that idiom, clueless? Anoetos, literally thoughtless. The light bulb is not on. You guys are not thinking. So to bewitched, like bamboozled, might be another good word. You guys have been tricked. Judaizers have done a little Jedi mind trick on you, if you're familiar with Star Wars lingo. Uh, you are not thinking. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now this was a church that was evangelized years after Jesus' passion and death. They're not talking about people that had witnessed Christ's passion and death firsthand. In fact, the Greek verb tells us this. It's literally depicted. Now exactly what Paul's alluding to there, we don't know because we don't know the on-the-ground on situation as well as Paul and the Galatians do. But some scholars suggest this points to something a little unusual in Galatia. Namely, that they latched onto the visible symbol of Christ crucified as a symbol of their faith, which was kind of uncommon. 
You usually don't make things like the electric chair the logo for your new religion. Uh, it's a gruesome, grisly way to die. And sort of an ultimate symbol to some people of Roman imperial thuggishness, that they would crucify folks. And so commonly you would see maybe the fish as a graphic symbol for the Christian faith. You all know where the fish comes from? It's a Greek anagram. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, Ichthus, Jesus Christus, Theohuios Soter. And the two lines indicating the divinity and humanity of Christ and the one person of the fish. Yeah, it's kind of nice. And then the other thing you see in Christian iconography from the earliest centuries, first page of your catechism, you get an earliest image of Christ from the catacombs, Christ as the good shepherd, pastor bonus, shepherding over his sheep. Connotes laying down his life for his sheep, but doesn't depict it. But in Galatia, apparently, they were so into the saving power of the cross of Christ that they were even cool with it being depicted publicly. That's how in love they were with the message of the gospel. And now Paul tries to remind them, where did that go? You've pushed it all aside, you've forgotten about the centrality of the cross, and now you're busy subordinating the cross to things like circumcision and the works of the law of Moses. What happened, guys? And to follow that up, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Did you really experience so many things in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles amongst you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now again, we don't know, but what are these works of the Spirit, these miracles? It's quite possible, as we've seen in Acts 10 with the conversion of Cornelius, that when these Gentile Christians heard the gospel in faith, they received the visual outpouring of the Holy Spirit, like the gifts of tongues that we saw in Cornelius' household, or maybe it was miraculous healings. Doesn't Jesus associate those all the time? Go, your faith has made you well. And so there were some visible works of the Holy Spirit performed as signs of God's favor amongst them when they first heard the word of the gospel, when Paul preached it to them. And so he asks, if you already received these miraculous signs of divine favor, long before it even entered into your head, to receive circumcision and keep the works of the law of Moses, how did the Judaizers ever make you forget all that and convince you that you were not pleasing to God because you were not circumcised and you were not Torah-observant Jewish Christians? Does that make sense as a quick argument? Now, Paul is a good rabbi. He's trained under Gamaliel, and he's dealing with Jewish Christians. So if anyone's going to make a proper rabbinical argument to Jewish Christians, it's Paul. And that's what we see him turn to in Galatians 3.6 through 3.18. Old style of rabbinical argument is to base your argument on two authorities, first and foremost, the law and the prophets. The law because the Pentateuch was the premier word of God, the law of Moses, the five books of Moses, and then the prophets following up right upon that. And so Paul does that, and then he adds to it what he calls his human example. We might call it an argument from right reason. So we get the law, the prophets, and right reason all testifying to Paul's thesis that justification is by faith and not by works of the law. First argument from Abraham, 3, 6 through 9. Thus, now don't forget about the thus, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now that's a quote, and the apparatus tells you it's a quote from from Genesis 15, 6. So you see, Paul continues, it is men of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are men of faith are blessed with Abraham who had faith. Now to get this argument, it is absolutely essential that you know Abraham's biography. Whenever you get quotations from the Old Testament, they will not make sense unless you first go back Read them in context. So a quick review, and I put this on the handout, of Abraham's life. Abraham's called in Genesis 12. And his entire life might be seen as a test of faith. Abraham's called to this day in our Eucharistic prayer, our father in faith. Abraham was great because of his faith. Why is Paul focusing on Abraham? Yes, he's an exemplar of faith, but he's also the patriarch of the entire Jewish nation. Hopefully all of you know that he is the forefather of the race of Israel. So he's in some ways the super Jew. He's the most eminent Jew. Everyone, even Moses, reveres Father Abraham. And Abraham is known 
for his faith. Some people divide Abraham's life into ten tests of faith, but he's asked during the course of his life to rely on God above dependence on any natural good a man might rely on, starting with his very call in Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. So he has to abandon all the comforts of homeland and native people and familiar geography. And he has to become a pilgrim in a strange land. And I will make of you a great nation, God continues. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and him who curses you I shall curse. And by you shall all the families of the earth bless themselves. So that's the covenant promise God gives to Abraham. Some people wonder why Abraham and his family get a special covenant. Previously, God dealt with the whole human race altogether. With Adam and his posterity, that's everybody. With Noah and his posterity, that's everybody. But with Abraham and his posterity, that's not everybody. And one thing our Lord and Paul have to do is to shake uh, Jews and Jewish Christians out of the idea that somehow these covenants with Abraham and with Moses and David were for Jews by Jews and didn't have any ultimate purpose with respect to the Gentiles. And we'll see what Paul is beginning to do with this reading of the life of Abraham is to remind his audience of God's universal salvific purpose. Still there, just like with, a with Adam and with Noah, but now expressed through the instrumentality of Israel. God is setting Israel apart for a purpose. And that purpose is, as this text tells us, that all families of the earth might find blessing in Abraham. Or as Isaiah says, that Israel will be a light to the nations, that my salvation might extend to the end of the earth. Or as the very closing quote of the life of Abraham also repeats, Genesis 22, after the ultimate test of the binding of Isaac, Genesis 22:18, we read, and by your descendants shall all the nations of the earth bless themselves because you have obeyed my voice. And so in the posterity of Abraham, someday in God's plan, all the families of the earth will find blessing through the seed of Abraham. And Paul sees this being worked out as he explains in chapter 4 of Galatians through the coming of Jesus Christ. But he wants to remind us first and foremost about how Abraham himself was justified. Genesis 12, Abraham's called, receives God's promise. Then he goes about his tests. He goes to the land of Canaan. He's not received well there. Then he loses his wife to Pharaoh, and only by God's intervention manages to get her back. Then he fights the perilous battle of the four kings against five and comes out victorious. That's where he gets his blessing from Melchizedek. And after all this, we come to Genesis 15, where our text is taken from. This is Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what wilt thou give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, thou hast given me no offspring, and a slave born in my house shall be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man shall not be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. So that verse, Galatians 15, 6, sorry, Genesis 15, 6, which Paul quotes in Galatians, gives us a proof text from the very law of Moses. Genesis, one of the five books of Moses, gives us a proof text. How is someone justified? Well, we're told that Abraham, in Genesis 15, 6, is justified by virtue of his faith in divine promise. That's two chapters, 14 years, and one Hagar-Ishmael incident before circumcision is introduced as a practice amongst the Jews. That only happens in Genesis 17. Two chapters, 14 years later. So here we have Abraham, forefather of the entire nation, said to be justified by virtue of nothing other than his faith in the promises of God. Second argument from the prophets. Now the prophet invoked here is the prophet Habakkuk. 
and he's not that widely read, and I can tell by the frequency of people named Habakkuk that Habakkian piety is probably a little low. So I'll give you a thumbnail sketch of Habakkuk. He's a prophet. We can't date him precisely, but maybe around the 600s BC, shortly before the Babylonians would attack Judea, siege Jerusalem, tear down its walls, set fire to the holy city, and horror of horrors, destroy the temple, and drag God's people away into slavery for the Babylonian captivity. And Habakkuk knows it's coming. And Habakkuk is concerned. The wicked, all right, maybe this is their comeuppance. God's vengeance is finally upon them. But what about those that aren't wicked? What will they do? Habakkuk is concerned, and he receives a consoling message from God in Habakkuk 2.4. God says, Behold, he whose soul is not upright in him shall fail, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Now we talked about upright, righteous, justified, how all those terms work together last time. So Habakkuk is told, when you are in exile, right, in captivity, where you're not going to have the temple, the priesthood is not functioning. And so it's impossible to fulfill so many of those works of the law of Moses that involve sacrifice. What will the righteous do? Behold, he whose soul is not upright in him shall fail, but the righteous shall live by his faith. And so Paul says, look at that. Not only is this going law and prophets in terms of argument, but both before circumcision and the works of the law of Moses were introduced into Israel, and afterwards, in the time of Habakkuk, during the Babylonian captivity, those who are righteous can be righteous by faith. Therefore, the Judaizers cannot argue that somehow circumcision and keeping the works of, law, of the law of Moses are intrinsic to justification. Because if they were, part and parcel of justification itself, essential matter for justification, how could it be then that Abraham was justified without them before them, and Habakkuk's people were justified without them after them? Does everyone get the argument from the law and the prophets? Then Paul adds what he calls his human example, sort of from everyday life. I call this the God is not a used car salesman. Or sleazy used car salesman. I don't want to offend anybody. Who's a used, anybody a used car salesman? No? No one wants to admit it now. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. So in 3.15 he says, To give a human example, brethren, no one annuls even a man's covenant. Now RSV says will, footnote, covenant. They mean last will and testament there. The Greek is diatheke, same word used for covenant all throughout the Bible. Chances are, though, the only covenants you'll ever make is... Uh, everyday human being are the covenant of marriage and probably your last will and covenant where you bequeath your possessions to whomever. So he grabs this notion of a man's covenant. RSV glosses it as will. No one annuls even a man's covenant or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say to offsprings referring to many but referring to one and to your offspring which is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if inheritance is by the law, it is no longer by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So the inheritance here, the inheritance of Abraham, is this promise of salvation. It's the salvation that God gives to Abraham by promise. And he says, if God first struck a deal granting this to Abraham by faith. No man, even in making a deal, goes back after the hands have been shaken, so to speak, and adds stuff onto it in good faith. Right? This might happen sometimes, but, um, you know, you say, okay, you're going to sell that car to me for $2,000? I will agree to buy it for you for $2,000, but we've got to sign it on paper because I don't carry that kind of money around today. So you come back a week later, and you're getting ready to buy the car, and the guy starts ringing on the cash register. He says, that'll be $2,317. So what do you mean? We agreed on $2,000. Say, yeah, but you read what you signed there. See, undercarriage treatment. You paid to have an oil change. You paid to have a detailing of the car, the vehicle washed and scrubbed and cleaned for you. People go, oh, dirty dealing. 
I thought we agreed on 2000 I get a car. Now I come back and it's $2,317. What gives? You added something to the bargain. Once we've shaken on the deal, not even a man can get away with going back and adding terms to the covenant. Does that make sense? And so Paul argues similarly, God is like the sleazy used car salesman. God is like someone who makes a covenant and then changes the deal. If first he says to Abraham, in your posterity, all nations will be blessed. And Abraham believes, and that's his righteousness, and that's all he has to do. And then God comes back 14 years later and says, well, and circumcision. And then God comes back 430 years later and says to Moses, and this big book of rules to do. And the ands keep coming. If that's essential matter to the inheritance of Abraham going out to all the nations, God has broken his word. And if it's unjust that a man break his word, how much more unthinkable would that be to attribute to God? That's a human example. We okay on that one? Now the question for the Judaizing mind, those are Paul's four arguments against. Short, short sort of argument from the Galatians experience. Abraham, Habakkuk, and then his human example. If the Judaizers are hopefully where Paul wants them to be at this point, on their heels, the next question is, why then the law? That's Galatians 3.19. Because I imagine the Jews, the Jewish Christians, a little bit like the elder brother in the parable of the prodigal son, saying, we've served you all these years, and now you're telling us that to be justified before God, you don't have to keep the law of Moses? What gives? What was its purpose? Just for nothing? Is God some kind of weird tyrant that says, well, if you want to be saved today stand on your left leg and wear a funny hat tomorrow three turtle doves it's clearly not capricious or arbitrary so what's the purpose of the law if the law doesn't save do you see how that could be a natural question in the minds of Paul's audience who was previously so law observant so Paul gives three arguments for the law all of them show a certain positive relationship between the law and the new covenant of Jesus Christ but all of them do this in a way that makes it perfectly clear that it's not like the law even begins to justify and Christ finishes the job, or that the law is sort of half of justification, or that justification is about the law and then Christ is a plus one on top of that, like cherry on the cake. There's a certain relationship, but the law does not justify. It only prepares for justification. And Paul steps through this in three steps. First argument for why then the law 319. It was added because of transgressions. Why did God make so much law? Same reason almost anybody else makes law. People are doing stuff they shouldn't be doing. That's sort of a simple argument. Since we're pressed on time, I probably don't have to further elaborate it. If people weren't sinning so much, God wouldn't have to say, now don't do that, and 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 there's a lot of that in the law of Moses. Fair enough. You can see uh, condemnation of people for doing bad things is important to ultimately getting them to do good things, but is not the same. Is that good? Second, is the law against the promises of God? Certainly not. So they're not opposed. For if the law, this is 21, for if a law had been given which could make alive, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture consigned all things to sin, that what was promised to faith in Christ might be given to those who believe. Now that's a pretty radical statement. The scripture consigned all things to sin. And by scripture he means the written law of Moses. That's what he's talking about here. Because this is an answer to why then the law. So that's pretty radical. What's the purpose of the law? To consign, well RSV says all things. You could even just read it, consign all to sin. The purpose of the law, second purpose, is to say to Israel, sinner. No, take it to heart. Hear it one more time, sinner. Sinner here, sinner there, sinner here, sinner there. That's sin, that's sin, that's sin, that's sin, that's sin. To be mean? No. Because only when Israel learns 
the radical nature of sinfulness can it appreciate what's offered in God's grace. How often does Jesus in the Gospels attack self-righteousness? Not righteousness, but self-righteousness. Because he wished to justify himself, he asked, Who is my neighbor? Because that man wanted to come off squeaky clean even though he hated Samaritans. Part of what Jesus does constantly in the gospel is to teach people about the radical nature of sin. We can make the mess and we can owe the debt, but we can't pay it off by our own power. Only God's grace can do that. God's been trying to teach the human race that since Adam. And so an essential component leading up to understanding what is offered to you in the cross of Christ which is remission of your sins and redemption, justification, is understanding that it comes through grace and faith and not by one's own power. Because a fallen man can do nothing to get himself out of the hole. And to do that, Israel had to be made constantly aware of its sinfulness. Because how often are the Jews, even with the sacrificial system and the Ten Commandments, cheating on the law and falling into this payoff mentality? Eh, today not so good. Extorted a bunch of poor people. Three oxen. Done. Kind of like you might do with MasterCard. $400 of debt, but okay. Bill comes, I cover it, I'm back to zero. That is not the relationship between a man's sin and his power to get out of sin. It's like stroking a check for $10 million on MasterCard and the bill comes and you go, oh my gosh. That's why our Lord loves the parables of crushing debtors. Right? You know the parable of the man that owes 10,000 and then he's forgiven and he throttles the guy that owes him 100? Or why Jesus loves people who are in positions of like medical infirmity that can't be cured. Or prostitutes. Once you've given yourself over to that kind of scarlet life, you just can't do a series of actions and get back to purity. Once you have leprosy, nothing under the sun can cure you, at least at that time. You have to have a certain understanding of only God can make you whole. Or Augustine puts it this way, only once you know how sick you are do you ardently desire the physician. It's a common mentality, yes? Some people don't like to go to the doctor. Uh, what's he going to tell me? I don't want to hear it. And then when the doctor says, I'm sorry, you've got cancer, oh boy, do you sit up and take notice and love that physician. Because if you don't, you're dead. So the scripture consigns all things to sin, lest people know the radical nature of sin, so that... What was promised to faith in Christ might be given to those who believe. So you see how this kind of a dialectical relationship between the law and Christ? The law condemns precisely so that Christ might bring justification. It's not like one starts the process in a positive way and the other does the other 25%. The first one's entirely negative. Condemnation. So that once one is on one's knees, can one receive salvation from Christ? Third argument gets us into what it means to be a good son or daughter of God and the value of our human works. Paul says, Before faith came, we were confined under the law, kept under restraint until faith should be revealed, so that the law was our custodian, says RSV, literally pedagogue, pedagogos, trainer of children, chaperone, you could say, until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Third argument is that the law was fitted for Israel in its infant and adolescent stage of covenant history. A pedagogos, now pedagogy means the art of teaching. That's not what it means in ancient Greece. It's literally disciplinarian. Somebody who was Johnny's chaperone. Didn't teach him, but brought him to school each day, carried his books, made sure he didn't play hooky, didn't hang out with the other Greeks who were smoking. Well, they didn't smoke back then. Drinking too much wine gave him a slap when he stepped out of line, kept him on the right path so that in adolescence he might grow to maturity one day, internalize virtue, and not need the chaperone anymore. So too was ancient Israel under the law. All kinds of rules and regulations, and Israel chafed under it sometimes like a teenager does his father's rules and regulations. But the purpose of that is that someday you wouldn't say, Dad, please come and tell me it's 10 o'clock and it's time to go to bed. The purpose is that someday you'll be without that chaperone and disciplinarian because the law is written in your heart. And you don't need the artificial reinforcements about right and wrong. You just do what's right and wrong. 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> you do what's right, and you avoid what's wrong. <laughs> you might do what's wrong, too, from time to time, but you're supposed to be the corrective of that. So the third argument is covenant historical. I knew, I, I knew it slipped something like that in there at some point in time. So are we clear on the relationship between this negative work of the law and what's promised in Christ. And then he takes that idea of the chaperone and gives us a beautiful image of what it means to be an adopted son and daughter of God. For one, he says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no better off than a slave, though he is the owner of all the estate. But he is under guardians and trustees until the date set by the father. So too with us. When we were children, we were slaves to the elemental spirits of the universe. But when the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So through God you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, an heir. And so Paul rests his image there, with Israel in the fullness of time under Christ becoming an heir to the promise of Abraham by having the spirit of Christ in our hearts we become adopted sons and daughters of God. And I think that's going to be a a great metaphor to keep in mind for understanding how the things that we do once we've received grace and faith genuinely have a certain good or meritorious standing before God. And before we touch that, the last text I want to look at is Galatians 5.1 where Paul talks about freedom. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Free from what? Free from the works of the law of Moses. Stand fast, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Now I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is bound to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law, You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is of any avail, but faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who called you. And then a little bit later on, in 13... For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love be servants of one another. So once one has received this position of adopted sonship, what does one do? This begins to get back around to the importance of the moral behavior, even for those who are in a position of being justified. What should one do? One should do works of love of God and love of neighbor. Now notice how Paul expresses himself here. Faith working through love. What does faith mean for Paul? Now, a lot of people begin with either a narrow definition of faith or or sheer confusion about all the ways in which faith, faith can be taken. Faith and love are two much abused words in the contemporary English lexicon. Faith can mean a lot of things. Sometimes Catholics talk about the faith, yes, by which they mean kind of the deposit of doctrines handed down from the time of apostles through the church to us today. Well, do you have the faith? Well, you could have it. Well, here it is. I'm carrying the catechism. Now, that's not what any Christian means when he says he's saved by faith. I got a copy. (laughs) There it is. Protestants might think that, but we're not works righteous like that. Uh, Faith could also mean a certain intellectual assent to propositions. I used a GPS to get here. I had faith in the thing because I don't know the map of Annandale. It's the second time I've been here. The first time was the last talk. I went by faith. I trusted the cartographer. Certain trust, certain assent to knowledge there. Faith can also mean something that's kind of like an ardent belief. Yes? Lots of nuances about what faith entails. So the two things I'd like to tackle the end of this talk, is what does faith mean for Paul, and what does it mean to be free? So if you want to look at the Catholic process of justification, just to begin to package this all together, 
How is a Catholic to understand the Bible's teaching on what it means to be saved? How do we understand this process of going from a state of condemnation to a state of right standing before God? And here I wanted to fatten up our reading of Galatians with some quotes from other major epistles like Romans and Hebrews. So we start in our position, as we said, the first lecture of condemnation. Nice text to remember here, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul, a good Jew, has Psalm 14 in mind there. So we find ourselves in a state of sin. That's the human condition since Adam. And we want to do something to change that. First, before you can have faith, Paul teaches us, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You don't know what to believe in unless somebody tells you. This is the odd extra way that we come to have faith. Because either Christ preaches it to you on the shores of the Sea of Galilee or knocks you off your horse. There's no horse in Acts, but knocks you off your horse on the road to Damascus. That's how we tend to depict it. Uh, Or else the church, somebody, whether it's your godly neighbor or your priest or whatever, evangelizes you. It comes out extra. You have to somehow possess the word of Christ. Notice, at the very outset then, the church is instrumental in the process of coming to have faith. Either from the head or from members of the body, one somehow has to come into contact with the gospel through the church. Luke and John, two nice texts there. He who hears you hears me, Jesus speaking. And then, amen, amen, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life. So either you believe Christ or you believe he who is sent from Christ. And in that belief, you come to have eternal life. Now, that alone is not enough. Because how many times have people had the gospel preached to them and they go, Phooey, I want nothing to do with that. Yes, something else internally has to happen. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 12. And how do we as Catholics understand that? The same way Protestants do. You need to have grace come into the heart and assistance and interior illumination in order to grasp the message of the gospel as something you might believe in and not just some foreign piece of data out there. You know, sometimes people bump into the gospel a dozen times. But maybe on that 12th time, biblical number, he says, wait, that's something I could actually believe in. I've heard that message, and for some reason now it stands in a new light. That interior illumination doesn't give you new information. It's not new content. It's an interior light that helps you to assent, to see the gospel suddenly as something believable. This is a preparation for being justified. So one can do nothing, first off, in a fallen state without grace, and even before one believes, grace is already working in the soul. To use scholastic terminology, we sometimes call that prevenient grace. Some theologians call it operative grace because it works on us without us rather than cooperative grace that works on us and with us. So first, grace acts on you to make the gospel something to be believed. Then comes a critical moment. What happens next? God's knocking at the door. One sees the gospel as something to which one might assent. But faith, after all, not in its objective content, but in terms of an action that a man performs, involves an assent of the will. If you're taking something on faith, you have to decide to believe, precisely because that data doesn't come from your own process of deduction. You don't deduce the gospel as the only necessary consequence of the facts around me. When I believe the cartographer, I go, he knows I don't. But I believe him because his job is Rand McNally's multi-million dollar enterprise. And when God reveals, who can neither deceive nor be deceived, it's something that we didn't come up with by our own human intellect. And like any other ascent of faith, involves a movement of the will. God will not save us without us. God requires that we have faith And for the faith to be ours, it has to genuinely involve us somehow. And so, God gives a second grace. A grace that sometimes Paul calls the grace of faith. 
the grace that assists us in making that ascent to the message of the gospel. Now, faith has to be ultimately about something. And this is a critical aspect for Paul. Faith isn't just about some general tenet. What's being believed? The gospel. What does the gospel say? All kinds of things. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. What's being had faith in? The gospel. What does the gospel contain? A program for the Christian life. It's not like you can separate. Well, one just has faith, kind of objectless. And then there's all these other things a Christian should do. The object of faith is precisely the gospel, the word of God. And so if one believes this, this gets us into our second aspect of faith. Now, I think it's against federal law to yell fire in a crowded room, so I'm not going to yell fire, right? But if I said to you, I honestly believe this room is on fire and we're all going to die, and I continued to lecture, you'd probably say he doesn't really believe it, right? Or else he's a little crazy. If you have an earnest conviction, right, that something is this way, that you're convicted intellectually and you've assented in your will to a certain proposition, and then you don't follow up on that with further assents and actions that are congruous with that conviction, either you've cast off your previous conviction or you don't really believe it. Does that make sense? I'm kind of building out from first, faith as an object, something to be believed, then faith is something assented to, and then faith is something lived. These are all valid senses of the word faith. And Paul talks about that kind of faith too. He calls it the obedience of faith in Romans 1. Paul says of himself, through whom, through Jesus Christ, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name amongst all the nations. This is also the sense of freedom that Paul talks about in Galatians 5. Now that faith is come, what are you, brethren? You are free. You're free from the works of the law of Moses. Does that mean it's a freedom fest? No. The classical conception of freedom, very smart, unlike our modern sort of flailing notion of freedom. It's always freedom from something for the sake of something good. Paul says you're free from the law. But what are you supposed to do? What's the obedience of faith? It's works of love of God and love of neighbor. Interesting, Council of Trent loved this phrase, hung its entire hat on that, in the middle of the decree of justification, which I passed out for you. It has this centerpiece, these two quotes from Galatians, 5, 6 and 5, 14. Faith working through love and works of love of God and love of neighbor. Faith works. It does something. Paul's understanding of faith includes the living out of faith. Does everyone follow me there? Now, what does that living out of the faith look like? Third page. Baptism. How often does Paul associate the having of faith with baptism? We know from our Lord's teaching that baptism is essential for salvation. John 3, 5, Jesus answered, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then the Great Commission that we talked about last time, go therefore and baptize all nations. So part of having faith in the gospel means, I want to be baptized for the remission of my sins. If it doesn't mean that, either you haven't received the correct gospel, or else you've ceased to really be convicted in faith. Some point faith has died, if it's not ardently desiring baptism, and won't rest until it has it. This was the constant preaching of the apostles. Acts 2.38, Peter says to the first 3,000, Repent all of you and be baptized. Not repent and have faith and go on your merry way, but repent, which is the first fruit of faith, and then be baptized. It's part of the same motion. Galatians 3.25, Paul writes, Now that faith has come, we are no longer under a custodian, for in Jesus Christ you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You see how he slides without even so much as an afterthought from faith to baptism? 
They're part and parcel of the same motion for Paul. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Can you mess it up? You bet. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor robbers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. <laughs> Isn't that a nice word to the Corinthians? But, look at the unity in Paul's phrasing here. But, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. The other text which I think is so beautiful is Hebrews 10.22. You get everything in one big enchilada. You get faith, hope, charity, repentance, baptism, and good works. All in three verses. Take a look at this passage. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, that's the repentance, and our bodies washed with pure water, that's the baptism. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. So do you see how in Paul's mind it is all one thing? It begins with what you might call the receipt of the objective content of faith. Then it requires the believing of the faith, something we can only do by grace, only by the Holy Spirit. Then that faith is lived out because either you don't believe it anymore or you're not acting on your convictions. You're not really believing it if faith doesn't work through love of God and love of neighbor. That's our integral Catholic understanding of the process of justification. It begins with the hearing of the gospel, and it starts with grace. Can't do anything without grace. And then when one assents in faith, it's also only by the power of God's grace that one has the new life and ability to do that. And then when one does good works, acts of love of God and love of neighbor, is it by one's own power? No, it's still with grace, with that cooperative grace or as Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so we can say, quite firmly, to Protestants, I believe that we are justified by faith. We do. That's sacred scripture. But what does faith mean for us? Does it mean what they mean, which is purely an intellectual assent and no more? That's the faith alone? Absolutely not. Being a good son or daughter of God means being someone who is faith working through love. That's why I like the adoption metaphor. And this will break, get us a little bit into the language of merit, and maybe I'll wrap up super quick with, because Sabathine's giving me the time sign. Was those two zeros, or was that the rocks that you are going to throw at me to stone? <laughs> Both, okay. Because um, I want to go to the third heaven. I want to see what's going on there. Um, so, so think about the notion of, of what it means to be a good son or daughter. My parents are not rich people. My father has this funny saying. He looks around at the house and says, Someday, son, all this will be yours. <laughs> now, the further rub is I'm an only child, so there's no one else he's going to give it to. <laughs> but nonetheless, were I to be some miserable, reprobate person, maybe, I don't know, never asked him, uh, my father would find it in his heart to write me out of the will. Sometimes people do that. When you finally cross the line in the sand, you're written out of the will. But the one thing you realize becoming a parent, and hopefully you realize even before that time, is that you will never pay your parents back for all they do for you. I know one libertarian, one hardcore libertarian, who's keeping a sum, and he's going to deliver a bill to his children. <laughs> but uh, besides for that fruitcake, uh, you realize that uh, being a good son or daughter is something where you receive an inheritance that is vastly more than you ever put into the deal. But nonetheless, there is a certain real relationship between the good things that you do as a son or daughter and the vastly greater things you get as your reward, as your inheritance. Yes? That's why I like Galatians 4 as the premier way to get into this notion of merit that we have as Catholics. Because Protestants hear this, and sometimes 
they freak out. And rightly so, if they think that we think that we are doing something by our own fallen power, that we then, as a misbegotten little set of graceless goods, hold up before God and say, you owe me. I did it, you owe me. There's two problems there. One, the idea that somehow we do anything without grace that's pleasing to God, that's plainly false from how Paul conceives of it, that's plainly false from Catholic teaching. Without grace, we can do nothing. Jesus even tells us that in John's Gospel. But the second problem is a problem of merit. Sometimes they misunderstand what we mean by merit. The merit that, and it's impossible to avoid languages of exchange. If Paul wasn't such the theologian of grace that he is, we'd think he's a sordid Pelagian, self-righteous guy when he says, I have fought the good fight, I have run the good race. He's waiting for his crown. That could sound, if it weren't Paul, like, ugh, who do you think you are? Waiting for your crown from God. Of course, Paul says, I don't do anything except by God's grace acting in me. Most times when we talk about exchange, right? Because salvation is ultimately some kind of exchange. I do something and God does something with respect to me. I do something different, God does something different with respect to me. So there's kind of a relationship there. When you and I deal with the marketplace, we often talk about what's called condign merit. Are you familiar with that term? It's easy to remember because it comes from, if you're domine non sum dinius, exchanges of equal worth. When I buy that car for $2,000, I agree the car is worth at least the two grand I'm giving up for it. The beautiful thing about capitalism is that you usually think the car is worth a little bit more than two grand. And the car dealer thinks your two grand is a little bit better than the lemon he knows he's getting rid of. So the exchange point is the point of condign merit. When your goods are worth about what you're getting for them, that's a condign exchange, equal worth. A lot of labor is like that. The servant Paul refers to, he does three hours worth of work. He's paid $20 an hour. That's 60 bucks. What he puts in, he gets out, just in a different form. Sweat turns into money. Does that make sense? But another kind of merit, one that we find in other examples, my favorite one is the Virginia Lottery, is congruous merit. There's a certain proportionality, but they're not equal. Virginia Lottery is great. You pick six numbers, they have to be the right ones, the same as what Larry pulls out of that little box with the balls in it. You get $10 million. Who'd have thunk? You know, if you were an alien coming from a different culture, that would be genuinely weird. <laughs> the, the act of picking six numbers, as idiot savant-like as it might be if you get it right, is still sideshow entertainment. It is not worth intrinsically $10 million. If Ellie said, watch this, you pick them out, and I will then tell you what six numbers you grabbed from the ball box, that would be a great trick. But it's not worth $10 million. It's only by the sovereign initiative of the state of Virginia that you can enter into that wonderful relationship where you pay two bucks and pick six, and you get the jackpot. You have to do something. You have to pick the right six. You do a little less, pick the right five, eh, you get one million. Pick the right four, you get ten grand, you pick three, I think you get five bucks or something like that. So there's a certain relationship between what you put in and what you get out, but they're in no way equal. And you can only do that based on the sovereign initiative of Virginia setting up the rules that way. So too with inheritance. Can you walk up to somebody on the street and say, look, I learned how to tie my shoes, make my bed, I let out the dog, I painted the house, please give me your entire portion of earthly goods when you're dead. No. <laughs> the only reason parents do that is because they love you and they want to see you flourish and thrive. So you get this congruous exchange. You be a good kid, and at the end, you'll receive your inheritance. Do you ever put in as much as what you get out? Absolutely not. Do you have to really do it? Absolutely yes. If you don't, you'll be written out of the will. Do not be deceived. The unrighteous do not inherit the kingdom of God. But if you don't do it, you don't get the inheritance. If you do do it, then you have what we call in Catholic terms a certain kind of merit. Your faith has worked through love. And having become holy, having Christ living within you, having his spirit working through you, that's the life of grace. It's genuinely a life. It's a power that we get by our free will to shape and direct and choose. 
by virtue of that, God gives us the reward, the inheritance of Abraham. Is it reliance on our own strength? Absolutely not. Can we ever do it without God? We can do none of it. Could we ever lay claim to it? No, because it's a disproportionate kind of good. But can you genuinely speak of a positive relationship between the things that you do, the faith working through love, and the inheritance you receive? Absolutely. That's why St. James teaches in James 2, faith without works is dead. Or in John, if you love me, keep my commandments. If the love isn't there, one's not justified. One has ceased to be a son. If the works aren't there, the faith somehow went off the rails. One no longer believes, or one is no longer obedient. One's back in one's sins. That might be a good resting place. Uh, I didn't get to what Luther thought, which is a pity, because I knew I was trying to do too much. But maybe we could do that in a question. <laughs> Thank you very much, Harry. Is that, is that a decent resting place for right good. now? Thank you. That's too long. I'm sorry. If he wasn't so good, I wouldn't have let him get away with the double zero like three times. Okay. 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 Tell us about Luther. <laughs> okay, okay, but you have five minutes to answer all of your questions. Okay. That's not just for one question. I'm going to try to do okay. the Sabatino thing and ram it in as fast as humanly possible. <laughs> Um, Luther did not get up one morning and decide to be like the biggest heretic the Western Church has ever known. Uh, some problems that led up to Luther, yes, ecclesiastical corruption, bizarre catechesis about indulgences, but most importantly, a strange view of how f God and man interacted in this understanding of faith. The short story is if you get rid of formal and final cause, it causes a real big problem for theological vocabulary. People stop thinking of grace as a life which then the free will could direct or use, and thought of grace as kind of like a force. And the common metaphors for justification in Luther's time, Gabriel Biel and some other people, were that the soul was kind of like a barge, inert, right? And it was pulled through the process of justification by two forces, God and man. Kind of like two donkeys leading a barge to the lock. Or it was like two wings of a bird that it took flight. And Luther rightly said, if that donkey's dead, it's dead in its sins, that barge isn't going anywhere. If that wing is crippled because of sin, that bird can't fly. They were weird sort of materialist notions of how God and man cooperated, which was never the Thomist or never the biblical way of understanding it. And so Luther had a certain bad theological background, but also, because of his own personal issues, a very negative view of the human will. In his view, the human will could only sin and was impotent in its sins. He called it an ass to be ridden either by God or the devil. And therefore, he saw zero positive contribution the human will could do in the process of justification. He said, just like a teaspoon of dung soils a gallon of water, any mixture of the human free will and God's grace makes the whole thing foul. Now Augustine, when he read Galatians 3.23, the scripture consigned all things to sin. Understood works of the law, yes, to mean the works of the law of Moses, but also because he was debating, Augustine was, with people who thought you could earn your way to salvation. Augustine saw that bringing to your knees power of the law as kind of its symbolic value. He said the purpose of the law of Moses, what does the law of Moses equal? Ultimately, it equals the worthlessness of any human act that a man does in the state of sin. That's correct. And that is genuinely part of what Paul's going after in Galatians 3.23. The worthlessness of any human action in the state of sin. Luther, an Augustinian monk, fattened that out according to his more radical view of the depravity of the human will. And said, ah, what's the law? The law is a symbol of the worthlessness of any human action whatsoever. Done either with grace or without it. So works of the law of Moses equals Exodus 20 through Deuteronomy. For Augustine, it's a symbol of the worthlessness of anything we do without grace. And for Luther, it's a symbol of anything a man does of a deliberative character whatsoever. So not digestion, but any voluntary act 
That's a work of the law in the very expanded Lutheran sense. That's where the Lutheran understanding of works comes from. So in the Lutheran view, it's all God's work in us and none of our cooperation with God's grace. Faith is something that we can either reject or receive, but we no way cooperate with. If it's anything positive, it's God's work in us and not anything that we do in cooperation with that. And all the faith is, is what Luther called fiduciary faith. It's that first sense of faith as content affirmed. Not lived out, but simply affirmed. I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. And after that, anything else a man does is irrelevant. For Luther, justification begins and ends with the having of purely fiduciary faith. I believe that Jesus died for my sin, full stop. Because anything my will does later, worthless, even with grace. Anything after that is simply fruits. So as he said, if you manage to somehow commit adultery and still have faith, you're still justified. Or he would sometimes describe the state of man after grace as simul justus et peccator. At the same time, a just man and a sinner. A just man insofar as I believe, and a sinner insofar as I continue to do the wicked things that I've always been doing. The Catholic view, by contrast, that faith has to work through love. Or sometimes we prefer the Corinthians language, we are sanctified. We are made holy by Christ's Spirit living in us. And because we are made holy, if we stay holy, we do holy things. And by virtue of that faith working through love, we are justified in the Catholic view. In the Lutheran view, one has faith. Faith is God's work in us without us. And as long as it stays in us, it's by virtue of that alone that we're saved. So that faith alone means just that. And what they mean by faith is a rather constricted view of faith compared to what the scripture means by faith and what Paul means by faith. Was that good for five minutes? Yeah. Three minutes? Right. Two minutes? Okay. And just because I was going to get there, I promise. Okay, it's uh, grace working through faith. Is that correct? I'm sorry, grace working through love. Faith and working through love. Jesus said, keep my commandments if you love me. What are the commandments? The Ten Commandments to uh, stone an adulteress? What are these commandments we should keep? Good, good question. Um, and that's part of what we saw. That's why I wanted to flag that in both Acts 15, James's addendum, and in Galatians, where Paul wants to talk about faith working through love. Um, is it the Ten Commandments? Let's say it this way, just to get to the finished answer. Catholic theology typically divides the old law into three areas. Uh, moral precepts, ritual precepts, and kind of civic precepts. The moral precepts are the place that we'll turn for some insight into the moral commandments. But even in the Ten Commandments, do you keep the third one? What's the third one? Everyone's got to do their Catechism 101. You say go to Mass. That's not what it says. Keep holy the Sabbath day. That's Friday night to Saturday afternoon. When's the last time you did that? Vigil starts after five, doesn't it? And so uh, even the Ten Commandments, right? So this has to be something that the, the church works out. What is the fabric of Christian morality? How do we understand love of God and love of neighbor? A foundation comes from the old law, but it's only some of it. Not the entirety of the law of Moses, because there are penitential precepts, legal things like what to do jurisdictionally for people that do certain crimes like stoning, uh, things pertaining to the use of the land of Israel, all that is not relevant to the Christian moral life. The civil stuff, not relevant. The sacrificial stuff, fulfilled in Christ. The moral stuff, good starting point. And then that has to be deepened, because our Lord deepens the law of Moses in the Beatitudes. You've heard it said to men of old, but I say to you. So the church has to elaborate the moral life, and that's part of what moral theology still does today with disputed questions. Thank you very much, Professor okay. Eric. Should we have uh, Professor Janosowski back again? Okay. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155.
and may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us. <laughs>